Morning, Life Church kids! You weren't ready for that, were you? Today we got a new lesson. Who remembers who we're speaking about? Who remembers who we're teaching about? I know the older ones do. Some of the older ones do. Hadassah, give it to me. David and Saul. David and Saul, you're half right. Half right. Matthias, who are we speaking about? David. King David. And today's lesson is called God's Covenant with David. Now, first of all, I want to ask here, who brought Bibles today? Who brought Bibles today? Give me a second here. Bibles. I got Jordan with one. Who else? Jonathan's got one. Who else? Hadassah has one. And Kaya, where's yours? You got a smile on your face that says I'm lying to you. Yep. Let me see your Bible. Okay. You have it? Yeah. You don't. No, you don't. Kaya has one. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Tell you right now, most of you got Bibles, right? You got Bibles at home? If you don't have a Bible, come see us. If you don't have a Bible, come see us. We'll make sure you get a Bible. But bring your Bibles to, to Children's Church every My Sunday. Well, you got to bring it here. You got to bring it here. Because if you bring your Bibles to Children's Church, these, these kids are going to get points. We're going to start doing points. And when you get enough points, you get to visit the treasure, the treasure box, the treasure cabinet, the treasure closet, the treasure closet, yeah, the cabinet of goodies. I don't have a Bible. We're gonna have some stuff in there. So when, when you guys bring your Bible, you're gonna get points. When you guys, uh, if you guys participate in the lesson, yeah. you're gonna get points. If you guys bring a friend, you're gonna get points. If you bring an enemy, you're going to get points. Yeah. Ah, what are you laughing at? Okay. If you bring your brother, it doesn't count. He was coming with you anyway. Oh, my sister comes to you. If you bring your sister, it doesn't count. She was coming anyway. She's only half asleep. She's looking at me right now like, what is he talking about? That's all right. Let her rest. All right, so we're going to write those down. Matter of fact, we got them on camera. And so we're going to, we're going to make sure that you guys get points. And we'll, we'll announce, we're keeping track right now, but we'll announce what points it's going to be. Now, let me take care of just a little bit of business first of all. Let me take care of a little bit of business first of all. Uh, 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 right here, thank you. All right. Not mine, I'll tell you that. All right, so those of you who have your Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Samuel, in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6 and 7. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 7. Good morning. So 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 7. Now first of all, I want to start out with a word up top here. 
that you don't see too often. Does anybody know what that word means? Uh, Does anybody have an idea what a covenant is? That's a kind of a fancy word. You don't see it much except in the Bible anymore. Anybody got any ideas? It says covenant. Yes, what does it mean? What does it mean, Xander? I don't know. I don't know. Kaya, what does it mean? Like a promise. A promise? Yes. It's a promise. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? Hey guys, how are you doing? Any other ideas what a promise is, or a, prom a covenant is, rather? Yes, it is a promise. It's also an agreement. But, and this is where Kaya was right, that agreement involves promises that two people or two groups of people make promises to each other. And so you say, if you will do this, then I will do this. If you will do this, then I will do this. And I promise to you that if you hold up your end of the bargain, I will hold up my end of the bargain. If you do what you say you will do, I will do what I say I will do. And God is a God of promises. He makes promises to us. Now, here's, here's a question for you. What is the Ark of the Covenant? What is the Ark of the Covenant? You remember when I said that Moses built the Ark? And all you guys said what? Noah. Noah. Noah built, the Noah built the ark. However, the word ark in the Bible has multiple meanings. It's talking about the ark of the covenant, the boat that Noah and all the people got into to avoid the flood. But it also talks about it was a box that was built to symbolize God's presence with Israel and the items that were placed in it reminded Israel of their covenant with God and the Ark of the Covenant, guess who built it? Moses built the Ark. Noah. Nope. Noah. Oh, oh. This, this one, this one, Moses built. Actually, he didn't build it, but he and his brother Aaron got guys to build it. And Aaron was his brother, Moses his brother. A-A-R-O-N. Good morning. And so they got together and they had a, and it, I'm not a good person for drawing, but if you can imagine a box, so I need somebody who's good at drawing. I'm not good at drawing. I'm really okay. bad at drawing. Oh, I don't have to make a duty box. What? Okay, so here's a box and on the box they had two angels. One was facing this way with his wings spread out like that. One was facing this way with his wings spread out like that. It was all covered in gold. It was beautiful. Amazon angel? Oh, wow. Oh, it was oh, really beautiful. Oh, I'm sorry? I said Amazon angel. Amazon angel. Had nothing to do with Amazon, believe me. And inside the box, they put things that symbolized uh, God's covenant. They had inside of it, they had the Ten Commandments. They had Aaron's rod that budded, and they had some manna. Anybody remember what manna was? Anybody? Dad, you should know. Does anybody remember what manna was? It was what God gave the Israelites when they were getting out of Egypt? Yes, it was food that God gave them. They were wandering around in the desert. You ever been out in the desert here? I have. There's not a whole lot of food out there, is there? No. Some not, very not. dry. In fact, we're, we're, a, we're a lot more fortunate now because now I know none of you guys drive yet. Yet. I know you probably will be before long. But within five years, you'll be driving. <laughs> okay. I'll, already, I'm sure you're driving your parents crazy. Probably. But, you drive along, if your parents are driving, 
And it's not too far down the road, and you see McDonald's, McDonald's. Jack in the Box, Burger, Burger King, Burger King. Wendy's. Taco Bell, Wendy's. Wendy's. We had a lot of food. What a burger. You go out in the desert, though, if you go walking out in the desert, there's not a whole lot of food out there. And so God made sure that the children of Israel were providing food. And he sent manna down from heaven. And so they took some of that manna and they put it inside the Ark of the Covenant to remind them of God's promises, God's covenant. And I'm not going to go into that because we don't have a whole lot of time. But... The Ark of the Covenant was very, uh, was very much loved by the people of Israel. And one day, they were in a battle. And does anybody remember, those of you who have been here a few weeks, does anybody remember who the mortal enemy of the Israelites was? Uh, Kaya, what do you think? The Philistines. The Philistines. Oh, yeah. Philistines. They were the enemy of Israel. And one day there came a battle. And the battle wasn't going so well for Israel. And they said, hey, I know. Let's go get the ark. Because it symbolized God's presence. And they said, well, if the ark is with us, that means God's with us. Here's the problem. It's not a lucky charm. It's not a, you, don't get, you guys know what a rabbit's foot is? Yeah. What's, a, what's a rabbit's foot? It's a rabbit's foot. Why, why a rabbit's foot? <laughs> it's lucky. People think that having a rabbit's foot brings you good luck. How silly is that? It's just the foot of the rabbit, right? Yeah. How's it going to bring you good luck? They think it's going to bring you good luck. Well, they thought that having the Ark of the Covenant with them would mean that God is with them, and then that make, that's going to make the battle go real good. You know, a lot of people, they wear crosses thinking that if they got a cross around their neck, that's going to bring them good luck. That's going to bring them God's favor. But all it is is a cross. It's just a piece of metal. Now, it reminds... I'm sorry? That's the thing. If, if you don't know why that cross means something, the cross is... Well, what, what does the cross mean? Somebody tell me. Somebody tell me that hasn't had their hand up before. What does the cross mean, Xander? Oh, uh, that God died on the cross for us. Well, God. No, actually, he's right. He's right because... On the cross Yes, God sent his own son, Jesus. And here's why he's right. Because the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one. And so that's why Xander's right. So he, he died for our sins. And that it happened on the cross. And so that's what the cross means. When you see a cross in a church... That's a reminder. And remember what I told you guys earlier this morning. When you get in trouble and somebody takes your punishment for you so that you don't have to take it. That's what Jesus did on the cross. That's why the cross means so much to us. But see, some people, they just wear it around their neck like a good luck charm. Crosses aren't good luck charms. What they are is something that reminds you of what God did for you. And so they, they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the camp. They think, ah, oh, this... God's going to be with us now. Here's the problem. It doesn't work out that way. And at first, when the Philistines heard, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the camp of the Israelites, the soldiers all started shouting, Yeah! 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 God is with us now. We're going to win. And the Philistines heard that, and they got scared. And then they said, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why are we scared? We're more powerful than they are. Let me ask you something. Are you stronger or weaker than your sister? Stronger. Stronger? stronger. Is he? <laughs> 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 oh, there's going to be a fight to prove it. <laughs> I think he is, actually. Here's the deal. Do you need to be afraid of your sister? No. And yet, think about you being the Philistines and you being the Israelites. And the Ark of the Covenant comes into her camp, and she's like, yeah, yeah, we're going to win now, yeah, yeah. And at first, you hear all that noise, and you go, oh, my goodness, what to happen? I'm afraid. Oh, no. And then you go, wait a minute, she's just my little sister. What am I afraid of? Right? You afraid of him? No. No. 
Oh, uh, he can probably do some damage to you. Oh, God. Yeah. But you, and that's what the Philistines said. Wait a minute. These are just the Israelites. They're puny. They're weak. Why are we afraid of them? And they said, strengthen yourself. Do what you're supposed to do. And they went into battle against the Israelites. And the Israelites had the ark with them. And they thought, God was with them. Here's the problem. God's not a good luck charm. And the battle went badly for the Israelites. And even though they had the Ark of the Covenant with them, the Philistines won the battle. And what was worse? I'm going to make you sit up here. You need to keep to yourself. And the battle went badly, and the Philistines captured the Ark. And they took it back to their, to their cities. Now I won't go into what happened. Real bad things started happening to the Philistines. And they, they finally said, we give up, we're, we're going to give it back. And they ended up giving it back. And it, and it sat at somebody's house. The man's name was Abinadab. And it sat at his house for 20 years. Now I'm looking around. And there's only two people in this whole room that are 20 years old. Miss Faith and me. We're the only ones that are 20 years old. So think about it. That ark sat at that guy's house longer than every one of you guys were alive. 20 years ago, I just moved into my house. And it sat there. Now, go forward 20 years. Israel has gotten a king. The first king's name was Saul. And then... Saul disobeyed God, and God took the kingdom from Saul, and he gave it to David. And David became king, and for a while there, it was just Judah was on his side, and Israel was on Saul's son's side. And finally, they all came together, and they said, David, you're going to be our king. And the land had peace. And David said, the Ark of the Covenant needs to come to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city that God set up. And the Ark of the Covenant needs to be here. Let's go get it. And so they did. They, they got a cart ready. And they took the cart down to Abinadab's house. And Abinadab's two sons loaded the uh, Ark up onto the cart. And they started going. His son's name were Ahio and Uzzah. And they drove the cart. And as soon as the cart started on its way back to Jerusalem, and David was there, and they just had a celebration. But it wasn't long before disaster struck. Because the ox, you know, the roads back then weren't too, they weren't too good. And the ox was pulling the cart, and the ox stumbled and almost fell. And it shook the cart. And they thought that the ark was going to fall off the cart. And so Uzzah reached out his hand and he grabbed onto the ark to steady it so it wouldn't fall. And God killed him right there. Huh? Why would God do something like that? Have you ever taken a test in school yeah. and you don't read the directions and you start answering the questions and you think you did real good, and the test comes back, and you didn't do so good. Why? Because you didn't read the directions. When David, David was so anxious to get that ark back to Jerusalem, he didn't read the directions. God had left very specific directions on how the ark was to be handled. They were not supposed to touch the ark. Instead, the ark had hoops along the sides of it and they would stick poles into the hoops and the priests would lift the poles and the ark would be carried between them with the poles through the hoops and they did not touch the ark they made a mistake they didn't read the directions and Uzzah died and they found the next house guy by the name of Obed-Edom. And they said, "Here, we, we need to just leave this here. We had a problem. And they left the ark with him. And David went back to Jerusalem and he went down before God. God, why? 
him? Why did you kill him? What happened? What happened? And he began to read. He began to talk to the priests. He began to talk and he found out what happened. He didn't read the instructions. And three months later, now we're going to do it right. And the priests went down with him. And they brought the poles that they were supposed to have. And the priests carried the ark on their shoulder between the poles. And this time they did it right. David had always wanted the presence of God. Ever since he was a little child, he had wanted the presence of God. Did you know we have a book in the Bible called the Book of Psalms? You ever see the Book of Psalms in the Bible? Do you know what Psalms are? Do you know what Psalms are? Songs? Yeah, do you know that they're songs? What else? Poems. Poems? They're songs, they're poems, hymns. hymns, all sorts of things of praise and worship to God. And if you look at your Bible, and if you open it up right about to the very middle of the Bible, chances are really good you're going to come to the book of the Psalms. And there's 150 of them in the Bible. Did you get them? You got it. So did I. See? You take your Bible and you open it right down the middle, chances are really good you're going to get the book of Psalms. And if you don't, you're going to be really close. And David wrote most of them. You see, David had a heart to worship God. David loved to worship God. And he knew that when he worshiped God, you'd have the presence of God with you. You didn't need the ark, but the presence of God was with you. But he wanted to have that ark there. And so when the ark came toward Jerusalem, where's my eraser? It's over here. When the ark got toward Jerusalem, David said, it's time to party. It's time to celebrate. The presence of God is here. David began to dance. Now this David can't dance. But David the king began to dance. He got real excited. He began to leap. He began to leap. And you know what? Here's the problem. David was a king. And kings wore these heavy robes. Because it made them look stately made them look sophisticated, made them look kingly. But David said, I have no time for that. I got no time for that. And he took his robes off, and he was dressed like a common man, not like a king. And he began to dance. And he began to dance. What do you got there? Go ahead and read that for me. I want to. Oh, is that a song? Oh, you don't want to? Okay. He began to dance. He began to run. He just began to throw himself around. He was so happy that the ark was in Jerusalem. The presence of God was there. And I bet he looked kind of silly. <laughs> kind of like I would when I dance. <laughs> but you know what? He didn't care. He didn't care. He was worshiping God. David was worshiping God. And it was a real celebration. The people began to worship God. And they put the ark in the tent where it was supposed to go. And they just had a praise service. They had a worship service. And at the end, David handed out food to everybody. Now, one of his wives, see David had Three wives at this time. That, that was allowed back then. That's not allowed today. But he had three wives. And one of his wives, his first wife, was actually the daughter of King Saul. What? Yeah, after he killed Goliath, one of the things that he got to do was he got to marry King Saul's daughter. He's too young for him. He wasn't too young at that time. He wasn't like he was a little boy or anything. You know, this, they showed David as a like a nine-year-old boy. 
going against Goliath, but he wasn't. He was actually a teenager. He was, was kind of older. But he got to marry the daughter of Saul. Her name was Michael. M-I-C-H-A-L. Not like, not like we spelled Michael the boy's name. But you see, the name Michael has a meaning. It's a proclamation. It says, who is like God? And Michael looked out the window and she saw David dancing around. And she saw David with his robes off. And he's throwing himself all over. She looked at him and said, wow. Oh. oh, that's awful. Oh, I can't. I just can't. And she began to hate him in her heart. Oh, he's such a fool. Oh, he's, he's such a jerk. What's he doing? Oh. She began to hate him in her heart. And when David came home, Michael was there to meet him. And this comes right out of the Bible here. She said this. She said, oh. How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself in the eye, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. David, you just made a fool out of yourself. He said it was before the Lord. See, David wasn't having any of it. He said it was before the Lord. He said he told her he would not be restrained from worshiping the Lord. And that the people that she thought would look down on him for being undignified, instead they would hold him in honor because he dared to worship God with all his heart. You see, God's pleased when we worship him. God's pleased when we, when we just forget about what anybody else thinks and we worship God. God's not embarrassed when we dance. God's not embarrassed when we sing. You might not have the nicest voice, or maybe you do. God is not embarrassed when you worship Him. In fact, God loves it. He's pleased with it. And if you will set your heart to worship Him and not, not uh, worry about what anybody else is saying, you know, they say dance like nobody's watching. That's the kind of attitude that pleases God. If you'll worship God like you don't care if anybody's watching, I don't care if anybody's watching. I'm going to worship Him. That's the kind of worship that pleases God. And God was pleased with David. And God was angry at Michael. In fact, the Bible says that from that day on, Michael never had a child. Now, that may not seem to, to be a big thing to you guys. But back then, if a woman did not have any children, she was considered cursed by God. If they saw a woman without a child, and they, you know, if she had a husband and she didn't have a child, and they go, what was wrong with her? What, what did she do that God, that God cursed her? I'm going to stay away from her because she's cursed by God. God cursed Michael. Because she mocked David. See, God is pleased when you worship. He's not embarrassed at all. Now, part of I got just a little time left here. This is all leading up to this. You see, again, David's heart was set toward God. One day he was he was in his house. Now David was a king, which means David had the best of everything. David had a beautiful, beautiful house, a beautiful palace made of the finest wood. It was probably the finest building in all of Jerusalem. And not only that, he had palaces in other cities too, probably not as nice. But he had this beautiful palace to live in. And one day he's looking out and he sees God's tabernacle. A tabernacle was nothing more than a tent. David was living in a beautiful house, and God was living in a tent. And David said, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. Here I am living in this beautiful house, and God's got nothing but a tent. i got to build God a beautiful house. 
God deserves better. Can I tell you that God is pleased with that attitude? Now, God has the best. God, there's nothing that we can give God that he doesn't already have. Mm -hmm. But God is pleased with that attitude when we set it in our heart that God deserves the very best. And David said, I'm going to build him a house. I'm going to build him a beautiful house. And he was telling this to Nathan the prophet. And Nathan said to David, you go ahead and you do what's in your heart. God is with you. But that night, as Nathan was sleeping, God came to him in a dream. And he said, Dave, you tell David, you tell David, are you going to build me a house? Since we came out of, since the Israelites came out of Egypt, I've been in a tent, and I've never asked for anything more. Are you going to build me a house? And he said, no. No. I don't want you to build me a house. I will raise up a son of yours who will build a house. You see, because David was a warrior, David killed many people, and God said, I don't want that man to build me a house, but his son was going to be a man of peace who would not kill people. That was going to be the man who got to build God a house. But he said this, and this is, this is where we go back to the covenant. It's a promise that God made to David. He said, I am going to build you a house, David. I'm going to build you a house. And here's what he meant. He didn't mean a, a, a house made with wood or stone or anything like that. But he said, I'm going to build up your family. Your son is going to be king. And his son is going to be king. And his son is going to be king. And his son is going to be king. And, to be king. and I will not take the kingdom away from you like I did to Saul. However, as long as there are kings in Israel, someone from your family will be the king. Now, that, that's what happened. Every, as long as they had kings, as long as they had kings, one of David's descendants was the king. Not, now, for, and we'll get into this in a later lesson. The, the kingdom was again split into Israel and Judah, and Judah followed after David's house. But a thousand years later, a thousand years later, they didn't have kings anymore. And yet a descendant of David was born. And his name was Jesus. Jesus was a direct descendant of David. Let me see if I can get this right. Jesus was David's son, grandson, great, 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 grandson. Twenty-eight generations. If you go into the book of Matthew, it tells you all their names. And if you go into the book of Luke, it tells you all their names, 28 generations. But 28 generations and a thousand years later, a baby was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. And that baby's name was Jesus. And Jesus is king forever. He doesn't sit on a throne like we think of a king, but he's king in our hearts. And he sits on a heavenly throne, and one day he will come back and he will sit on a, a throne that we understand. See, God was so pleased with David that he chose to make his own son a descendant of David's too. That's how pleased he was with David. And, David's king, uh, and Jesus is king forever. So what does that have to do with us? What does, what does all this have to do with us? You know, that, that's a nice story about the ark coming into Jerusalem and David dancing and all that and, and God making a promise to David. Does God still make covenants today? Does He make promises today? Yes, He does. Let me tell you about one that was made in my family. My grandfather, his name was Amos. 
Now, if my grandfather Amos were still alive today, he'd be 123 years old. He was born way back in the 1800s. Now, I, I met my grandfather. I loved my grandfather. He died when I was 12 years old. And that was 45 years ago he died. But my grandfather, way back in 1935, started a church. And he pastored that church for over 40 years until 1976. And my dad tells me, this is my dad's father. And my dad told me that he preached the last sermon the day before he died. And he was sitting in a chair because he was too weak to stand. He worked in the coal mines, and, and back then they, you breathe in all this dust. This is why they tell you when you're, when you're around dust, wear a mask because the dust gets into your lungs and it does terrible things. And I've watched how my grandfather suffered because of the coal dust that had gotten into his lungs. And it killed him, actually. And the doctor told him, Reverend, you need to stop. You need to stop. You're going to burn yourself out. He said, Doctor, I'd rather rust out, or I'd rather burn out than rust out. And he would not stop, and he pleased everything he tried to do, he tried to please God. And God was pleased with him. And he told my grandfather, he said, Now my grandfather had six children. My dad was the youngest of the six. And he said to my to my grandfather, he said, I will make sure that all your children are saved. I will make sure that all your children are saved. Now five of them are gone. Five of them are gone now. They, they all grew old. And five of the six have died, including my dad. And there was one left. But let me tell you, every one of those five that have died loved God. Every one of them. And my uncle that's still alive, he loves God in his heart. And he's not going to be very much longer either, I don't think. But, you see, God made a promise to my grandfather. And not only that, but two of, the, of his six children became pastors. They became ministers, including my dad. He was one of the two. And on top of that, many of his grandchildren have gone into ministry, including me. And my sister, her and her husband were missionaries. And my, another sister, her and her husband were, were active in their church. And even one of his great-grandchildren is now a missionary in China, in a country where they don't allow you to preach the gospel. If, if they catch you preaching the gospel, they're going to throw you in jail. When God makes a promise, He really makes a promise, and He intends to keep it. And God makes promises today. If we will serve Him, if we will try to please Him in everything that we do, God will make promises to us, and He'll keep those promises. All right. Now here it comes, this is the time of the class that a lot of you guys like. Miss Faith is going to get ready the snacks.